Hey everyone, it's me, PHG QED, trying to make a short tutorial on how to make a needle map. It's gonna be an I wanna maker. It does technically work, like you could apply this logic to any map if you wanted to make. But I like working in maker, so we're gonna start there. And we're gonna do a simple needle today. So a couple of things I like to do right away are kind of decide some themes. I found that helps me get in the mood. This is a pretty good song, but I wouldn't mind something like a little bit more uh, laid back. I really like the uh, like the soft wood like wood themes and stuff that pop up sometimes. I really like those. That's a really good one. There's one really good one I'm trying to find. Obviously you can put on your own music too if you want to. I think it's called like Wood Note or something. I'm trying to find it. So there's like that, there's this. I still can't find it though. It's like it just called Wooden Egg. Frozen Forest sounds pretty cool. It's like a little abstract but nice, you know. That's a little too scary. Oh, I really like this one. But it's a little too open. Okay. I feel like it is just called Wooden Egg. I was gonna say if that doesn't bounce too hard, I can do it, but not that it bounces pretty hard. Isn't it just called wood note? What the heck is it? I might cut this out. If you want to use the song I'm talking about, just point me to it. That'd be great. Oh, there it is. Okay, so it does exist. Okay, <laughs> so once you've got your song or whatever. You kind of want to just pick a soft, pick a soft theme because I find like um, if you just sit down with the goal of making ah, oh, I want to make good needle, you're gonna sometimes wind up with something good, but oftentimes you'll struggle just because you kind of get the, the randomness will take you with weird directions. So we're gonna go for something simple, which means the most we can do is default gimmicks. That means no triggers, no moving stuff. Maybe look like, very small instances of like a moving spike or a moving apple, but that's about it. I have broken those rolls on occasion, but I'm going to try not to do soon. Let's do... I'll like, carry that wood theme if I make that like... Is I going to make that non-ugly? Not really. It's like bright pink. No, it's still pretty grim. Picking a tile salt helps too, just because it'll kind of shape the way that your jumps in the out. Just for me anyway, as an example, I would work a lot differently with like default spikes. It's supposed to like single color spikes, it's supposed to like default, you know, the white default versus the gray, you know, more organic spikes are leading in a different direction kind of thing. Um, I do like going quite simple with the majority of my designs, I like, I don't want to turn overloaded colors or, or a palette like over or anything. It's really simple. A lot of times I'll just, you know, go cover kind of a soft gray with like a tint on it. And the aesthetics are not ultimately the most important thing. They're definitely not the most important thing. The most important thing is how, how it plays. But once you have your, your loose thematic set up, when, one of two things you can do is set up a level border if you feel like it. Because that just gives you your box shape, right? And it tells you, okay, at least I've got the confines of that sort of space to work with. Or if you feel like making something a little bit more unorthodox, you can start with an open shape. But one of the problems you'll run into if you have an open shape is that you can't, like, your pathing won't become as clear to you. Although the inverse of that is you end up with linear shapes a lot of the time, right? So, this is like a little staircase. It's usually not worth starting the player too far away from the first jump, unless you want to have... One thing you can do is to put a save point right in front of the first jump for people who are wanting to set up, but then speedrunners can skip that as well. They just have the extra transition time right here, which overall is about too much, right? If you're working in Maker and not JTool, another really helpful thing you can do is to uh, 
make yourself a fake J tool save point. So you pick a save point, make your note tiny, and then uh, set it to automatically follow you as soon as it gets made. Now you can just shoot anywhere to save. You don't want to abuse that, right? Because if you find yourself, you know, saving in like midair of a water jump or whatever, that's probably you. So just you know, I'll just do like a real quick example or whatever. If you ended up setting something like this, right, and you got like you know this kind of thing, and you test it, right, and you're like there are five of these, and all the way over here, like okay, I got saved here, and I tested the rest, I proved it's possible. You're you're, you're not giving yourself like a good uh, hum a good human indicator of how hard that jump actually is. So one thing you can decide right off the bat, and that I like to do, is to have what I would call a barometer jump, which means I'm not probably going to put anything physically more demanding than this jump anywhere in the map. If I am, it's only going to be the start of the midway save point, and it will probably be then, ha it'll look hard, but it'll probably have it set up of some kind. Um, and the reason that I like to do that is because it, it just it gives new players a really good indication of like, oh man, did I pick the right map for me, or am I going to get boned the whole way? So say you start with a default game, right? So you have this right at the start. It's well known by this point that some to slash many new players who have not been used to platforming games, so say for like Mario or whatever, right? You've got two jump heights usually in Mario. You usually got the small jump height, which can be reduced to a certain amount, and then you get your full jump height, right? The kid has like, and this is not even remotely true, let's just say 23 <laughs> individual jump heights on his first jump, on their first jump, rather, and then I think 19 on the second one, 19 individual jump heights, not including cactuses or cancels or any bonk or what v-speed you're at, etc, etc, right? So this jump is hard for a lot of people, and the main reason for that, and I don't know how well covered this is, but it probably should be documented somewhere or just known, is that new players are always going to full jump. And the reason for that is that without having an awareness of those levels of radiation, right, you wouldn't even think to press the button for less time. Because in the vast majority of games, not even just Mario, but other games as well, like a fighting game, for example, you probably would have, you know, you've got your jump indicator, and maybe you'll have a long jump, and you might have a small one. You know, in most platformers, it doesn't go beyond that either. You've got two, two, maybe two distinct jump heights, and one that is possibly smaller than the other that is gravy, right? So how long you hold the button down does matter to a degree, but it'll cap there, and it won't then reinstigate, and it won't affect your fall speed, etc., etc., right? Plus, the kid's jump arc is fairly unique. It's quite organic in that it's not symmetrical. And one of the things you also see new players falling into the trap of is like, oh, I'll make this cool symmetrical jump. It'll look cool and it'll be cool to do. And then it only gets the first one right because it's actually painful to do. So if this is a map for brand new players, and let's just try to make it one, you want to give them the ability to full jump almost every single jump. And if you don't want to go full jump, you want to try to set up a scenario where the creation of the jump isn't punishing. Um, another big decision you have to make really early on is, do I want to do a drop for my first jump? It's honestly cliche, right? Um, it's been, you know, if we do this or whatever, <laughs> and then have like this, like, oh shucks, ah, <laughs> you know, and then you do the whole loop around and you go through the thing, etc, etc, etc. Um, it's definitely valuable, it's fun. But when I first started playing Needle, and you get this big stack of traditional Needle games that have been recommended, um, you see this a lot, and a trope of this a lot, and another variant is this one, right? The slightly lower ceiling. Let's just see. Yeah, there's there, there's no way with that ceiling there. Maybe even with a low cancel? No, you just, you just can't. With a one frame, you can't. So maybe there's some absurd way to cancel through it, but mostly you're going to burn your jump there too, right? And you'll develop your own preference over time as to whether or not you want to do the drop. If you do the drop, how do you want to burn the double jump? Um, try not to make it rogue, right? Because <laughs> one thing you can also end up with a lot, and you fall into the trap of, is every jump becomes just a mechanism as opposed to being something interesting mechanically or movement-wise. So say we do the drop, right? And we've got you burn double jump here. Well, I happen to know that that's free. And then if I just keep doing those, I'm sure it's that one afterwards, but let's check. It might be three. No, it's definitely four, actually. Oh, no, because I'm going to do the 16. Durr. Yeah, we'll do this. Do the 16, and it's free. There's the 16, it's free. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So, 
you, by following a formula that is known, you can you can wind up with a lot of serviceable jumps. But what I'm effectively doing here is kind of just creating a fill in the dots picture that <laughs> I pick my own colors for. I think probably it's more interesting to try to create unique scenarios for players, even though you're doing something that has been done before. So in this scenario, for example, right, for me that one's extra fun because it isn't unlike. There's another scenario for this one, right? Which is that. Um, still equally possible, and maybe not even too much harder, but for a new player, that's a lot harder. Um, as opposed to having all that space to do your double jump in. And then once you're in the drop, you can make a couple of decisions. How do you want the player to interact with the fact that they don't have their double jump, and how do you want them to interact with the fact that they're not very high up? Um, because height is the soft currency in a needle map. It's really hard to explain what I mean by that, but I'll try. Um, positionally from the top of the map, it is more in your liberty to negotiate to anywhere else than it is if you're lower down. What I mean by that is, if we take these blocks away, and even if there's nothing here, right, and I just do a raw set of full jumps, not only the amount of space it covers, but anything in that trajectory then becomes sort of interactable. Whereas if I'm down here, I have my cap jump height, and that's it. I can't, unless I can 4.5, I'm stuck here for all eternity, right? <laughs> so uh, you got to think about it kind of in that way that once you lose the height and regain it, that is the, the soft currency or the soft power exchange that you're giving the player. And you want to decide, do I want to remove them of their agency right away? Do I want to... Um, do I want to let them regain it instantly? How do I want to negotiate it? A super duper classic one that I would like people to know about is the land and then slow fall, which kind of kind of easy. Depends on your positioning. I think I maybe made that too high, but we'll see. I think I did. Nope, you can still do it, but I would lower it still just because it, it would then therefore give you more opportunity to experience the slow fall. And all you have to do to, to necessitate the slow fall is you'll think to yourself, oh geez, can't you just jump out of here and it comes out kind of the same. Well, yeah, for the first part, but then you can also do this. Right? And a lot of this comes down to height limit. Height limiting and trajectories. Um, and you don't have to necessarily start memorizing the trajectories, but it is nice to have quick little guidelines when you're working, just so you know um, offhand. You don't have to want to test literally every single jump every single time. So say if I do this, for example, right, I kind of know offhand that since this works and burns the double jump, that this will therefore work. But I didn't know if it would necessitate the double jump. It turns out it does, which is great. It's a friendlier version of it. Um, then say I want to do a drop here, right? Well, I know technically I can make you at this V-speed do a, an unnerved corner. I'm not good at that. I'm terrible at corners, and I don't know how it's going to interact with that forced line. It could be the bad one. Maybe it is. So I, I don't know enough about corners to know if that's going to be a good jump or not, but I do know I do know this. If you nerf a plane by 64 pixels, it is possible at pretty much any V speed, including max V speed. It then becomes part of the task drop formula, but you can mitigate that by nerfing it even more. Nerf it, uh, what's up from 64? Although I can do it, 78? Maybe. That's even friendlier, right? It's a bit rote still. But it's definitely easily doable, therefore. I also don't know if I could talk about this in one video. It would probably cover the entire video, so I'm only going to briefly go into it here when we're doing this drop, and, and maybe again if we do it more. The way that, that jump integration seems to me to work is based, and what I mean by jump integration is, let's say that we set up this jump, right? And it's like that. Well, the main key there is you don't want to interact with that spike on the right. And that, to a degree, is fun. I think that starting uh, that starting a drop is pretty darn fun, because it just looks fun to fall into. You're going right through the gap. Maybe some people would 16 pixel that, me personally, no. Um, but when you're doing the actual drop part of it, or when you're doing any jump that comes out to be more of a jump than less of an accessory, um, the way that the jump's trajectory, or the way that the kid's trajectory overlaps with spikes, and the way that the spikes overlap with the way that trajectory would project outward, is kind of how you want to organize the jump. So if I have the drop here, 
and like, say I'm a new player and I don't know this, right? So I set that up, and then I do, oh great, that, that'd be really good. Um, and then I'm like, oh, well, what about, you know, and I'm trying to think, you know, maybe that, like the big triangle here. That's not a bad start to a drop, I would say, honestly, if you're, especially if you're a new player. Um, let me try to... Yeah, I kind of like that as a drop. That's actually really good if you're a new player, I would say, starting out. Because um, it, it's plain, but it's disguised. It has a little negotiation in the middle. And what you've accidentally done is, you know, provoke this thing that I'm trying to talk about, which is, if you take a 16 pixel, put it right there, that means that the kid has that much space, basically, to start moving away from this trajectory. If they were just to let go, and I'll show you, show you the bad version of this, which would be to do... Oh, one, one you'll see really common that I used to do anyway, you see sometimes, is uh, what people think is like an alternating one of these. So you see that, followed by that, followed by, you know, maybe the full open one again, and then one on this side. Is that still what I'm talking about? Or is it like the complete wiggle back and forth? Let's see. That want more than that. Oh, well, that, yeah, that's a really good example. <laughs> so there you go. If anyone does a drop like this, it's a, it's remorse, right? Because you might think it you want some kind of wiggle in there. You know, you got like a little, really, a really little tight space. You can. This is a mistake I made in my first game. Um, but no, what's actually going on is that there's a 16 pixel here. Anything overlapping with this side of the trajectory will cause the kid to have to move, but if it's spaced out 32 pixels, which is what maybe you would think is the normal amount of distance you want to occupy, there's always that 16 pixel gap going on. Which also means that if we want to design a drop, instead of doing things that we would maybe normally do, um, geez, let's see, so say we're on this 16 pixel grid, right? We maybe we would start doing some testing of the spike down here. And maybe you actually have to stretch those a fair ways to get it with those uh, double jump. But you don't actually have to, if you're off the 32 pixel break and you just did that 16 pixel overlap, you can get a lot more space and a lot freer trajectories. This one's not completely free, so do that spike thing. But it's definitely easier than something like that. I feel like I did a bad job of explaining that. Well, maybe I'm not great at explaining things in general. It's also definitely a nicer for me anyway to come down past that spike shape than it is to dodge out of the way of the plane sometimes. Because that's effectively the same. You could leave that there, it would be effectively the same. Although I guess with a bit more of a swerve, so maybe like down there. Yeah, it would probably be kind of similar. And then what do you want to do once you're doing a drop? Well, it's up to you whether you want to hold direction or you want to do the weave, or if you want to do some combination of both. If you're going to do a whole direction, try to make it slightly more unique than, like I said, just the stacked overlaps, because it is kind of rope. Um, I like doing little weaves, because I think they're really fun. Let's see. That, for example, is sort of easy and friendly. I would say friendly to new players, but you could nerf it even more just to make sure. When in doubt, nerf. That's a tenant somebody should write down. Noodle. Hi, Gaffro. Thanks for stopping by. Noodle. Or just Noodle. I'm trying to do a little brief tutorial about how you can go through making a basic map. And some beginner-friendly stuff, too. Because I think it's a lot harder than people think to make a map that is beginner-friendly and still fun. One cool thing about spikes in that orientation as well, if anyone doesn't know, is that the kid at any V speed has enough space to occupy this landing with any spike orientation. So that can be that one, it can be this one, etc. Right? Um, and it's up to you which one you use to determine the type of movement. In. So basically, the way that it works is a flat bottom or a flat side will require a stagger more often, especially if you're trying to, like, well, one thing you can do, I don't always do it anymore, but is to like set up a held direction uh, canceller. So you do something like this, right? Where if you are holding here, it's fine. But then if you're still holding, you gotta let go, etc. That's a little bit more advanced. Um, I was only nerfing that by more. Yeah, I was even nerfing down to here, I think. Uh, 
Uh, if you do this one, it's probably the easiest one. And that one, this one kind of just has a little bit of spice to it. You got sometimes got to stagger it, sometimes you don't. We would have to lower that quite a bit though, because it's going to cause a different type of overlap. I have a really bad habit of making my drops too hard, just because I'm good at drops and they're one of my favorite parts of the game, so I kind of have a blind spot about how hard they actually are, especially for new players. To me, that's like not a super intimidating drop. Um, hi, Wizzle. Thanks for stopping by. It's nice to see you again. As soon as I have an affiliate, I'm going to snap you with a VIP, but I do not have enough followers yet. So. No, thanks, Gaffro. I love watching your needle making stuff, too. Obviously, you're so far off the board in terms of uh, skill that it's hard for me to imagine ever playing any of your maps, but I just love watching them because they're so high level. Um, even with that landing, I'm like, mm, do I want to lower that a bit? And I think I do, just because, again, for new player friendliness, right? I wonder if I can provo provoke, like, a... Well, I have some habits that I like to fall into, so maybe we'll discuss those right now. One that I love to fall into is just to do hook jumps. Um, I can't remember where I first saw one. I want to say it was in Catharsis. Obviously, it's a super common jump format, but it it's it's just a jump setup that provokes that uh, turnaround, and I think that's really fun for any skill level to have that turnaround. So I might leave that jump, uh, that landing, unnerfed. Although I wonder, can I nerf it by... Um, can I nerf it by 16 pixels and still have you get over that, or are you going to have to double jump that? I think you have to double jump it. Or, like, it's going to be gross on one side. No, you don't have to, I don't think, but... Yeah, you have to angle your starting way more. I do like it, but I'm worried that it's punitive. It makes the landing less punitive, it makes the startup of the next jump more punitive. Hmm. Gaffer says, I had a if I'm good enough to join needle tutorials, but my preferred thing of needle making is using one feature more than one, such as specific water or vine. Helps you not waste the space and makes the path more interesting. Yeah, and I would say that's quite high level, to be completely honest. Um, is If you're just making, say, quote unquote, a needle screen, and you have like this whole palette or canvas open to you, and you start doing you know, all manner of etc., you're kind of going to get each jump maintaining itself for the novelty of that usage within the map. Meaning, like, if it's my only water to usage, I then get, before I get excited about it. Um, whereas if you start to use, say, I started with that, you know, maybe the, the slow jump that we talked about, and then you see water used again in the next section, but it, it works in a different way, that is just provoking more out of both the creator and out of the player. So really, really, really good point. Like and Gaffer says, yes, so I agree. That's, yeah. And I would honestly say I'm not great at doing that, because in my levels, almost more than anything, I like variety. So even if you see a drop like this, I'm already starting to cave a little bit in terms of, oh, well, everybody does the drop at the start, everybody does the landing to climb up. Um, that's why I frequently will cancel it out with the water to double jump regain. But I think for new players, A, that's a bit challenging, um, and B, it's rote for me now. So I'm trying to find, like, what's the middle ground between gimmicking myself to high heavens and putting triggers and moving fruit everywhere versus just going back to basics and making basically 32 pixels but nerfed. And I'm not quite sure what the difference is yet. Um, for me, mostly it's been the openness of the jumps and the restraints of the inputs. Because I'm starting to learn again, as new players tend to do, everything's going to be a full jump or like a very tiny jump that they did by accident. Um, complex movements in a row are going to be really challenging. And then once you start to layer multiple gimmick interactions, I think it's really fun for new players because they get to kind of experience that palette for themselves and decide what they would do with their own levels, where you have to have the nuance to both play a level that is complicated and then understand all the cool moving parts of it as well. So again, very high on the design. You can kind of decide here how easy to make the jumps, how... Although one thing that's really fun, I personally find this quite fun, um, is to do like a, a low height landing that normally wouldn't necessitate from the jump. So if we have this set up or whatever, and I'm probably going to just quickly do this so I can't get over there. Um, let's see, you could, you know, obviously go right up to there. Oh, if you have this set up or whatever, you can dictate to the player they can get as high as their full jump. But one thing I like doing is to set up a jump where you just lose height for no real reason. Like if you did this, for example. Oh, I already forgot how to do this. This is great. I might have to nerf that already. <laughs> 
How can I get the same thing but less suck? Um... Maybe? I might just take that. I keep forgetting that mini spikes are insanely useful as like a problem solving tool. I can't remember who else said that they agreed with that. I think maybe it was Katie Kun. That if, if you have a jump that's not working or you kind of need to just iron it into place, use mini spikes. So if you had that jump, that would be cool. But let's do this instead. <laughs> let's make you like drop all the way down there. That's funny to me. How can we do it in like a fun way? Um, mini spikes again? They're everywhere. Um, we gotta be careful here though, because, like, if you're requiring from the player that they get, even that 16 pixels is probably too much. Well, let's do the climb first, because I'm fairly certain I want it to be at least that high. And you can land down there. Let's bottom that out real quick. I end up with a lot of these 16 pixel gaps on my map. I don't know where they first came from, probably either. Tethys or serotonin. I just love the idea that you, <laughs> you know, like, who's, who's doing this? <laughs> I feel so bad for them, but also they're probably not feeling that bad for themselves, because, you know, you just missed it by that much. Um, so what am I wanting to do? I'm wanting to provo provoke a low thing here. Maybe to lower that a bit. Are we under something here? Okay. Yeah, and then you can still get away with a full jump, too. And that, what I might do, especially if you're a new player, I made a map recently that had a gap like this, and I didn't use it for the jump, but everyone I saw on the record dipped the gap. And I thought it was so cool that that's just an integrated strategy that people use. So maybe doing something like that would be cool. Look. Oh, I don't want to make it so prohibitive if you're going to hold left, though. Is there a way to do this? Hold on. That might be it. Hold on. Yeah, so I would do that jump like this, but if you're a new player, go to town. <laughs> That's really cool, I like that. Um, okay, what did somebody else bring up that was important to mention? I think it was Voracious Reader that said, it's important to think about different types of jump. In addition to the fact that the kid can jump twice, and you almost never see jumps that only require one jump, which is worth noting as well. If we do this, for example, that's kind of cool. Um, but in addition to that, there are different types of jumps that are beyond, like, holding a direction versus having to use your movement versus uh, having to bonk versus not having to bonk versus timing a certain something. And you want to try to set up at least a couple different flavors of movement for the player. Um, a shortcut to doing that is if you have an organic level design, like say you're designing a forest or a castle or a cave, you can say to yourself, oh, it would be really cool if in my story for the kid they, they climb they, you know, go, they go through the spiky mouth of the cave and then it gets like a little bit less spiky, but then they have to drop down a big cliff with waterfalls. Uh, and then when they get the cliff with waterfalls, it's all spiky at the bottom and they have to swim through the spikes and there's like angry fish. And by that point, you've already gotten your obstacles, you know, there. You just have to fine tune the variables. You've gotten a cool story. But when you're working with, okay, the kids, they jump and they fall and they go through some spikes and they go up with other spikes. <laughs> you have to at least think of the movement as uh, parkour, maybe, or mountain climbing. I've heard a lot of people refer to it as well. Uh, some type of traversal scenario that results in excitement that isn't just a bland little alien dude moving around a, a hell of spikes and blocks. <laughs> so for me, the way to do that is just to create different flavors of jump. So we've already got a couple. You know, there's an optional dip versus a stall. There's a ledge grab here that is a single jump usage, which is fun. And you've got what some people call the hiker jump or a bonk jump out to here. Which, remember, as a new player, is basically impossible. <laughs> Even as a player that does this all the time, I get scared by it. Um, and then what else could we do that would be fun? Some more, some more scenarios. Let's get some more scenarios in here. Holding is still not great there, but it doesn't insta-kill you, which is not bad. Um, I'm really tempted to resort to a moving spike. Ooh. And what I've been doing more often not than lately is have one apple and always make it a ledge, because I'm trying to get better at ledges. But then often I'll nerf the ledge by doing it as a standard apple, and then you just, you know, sink that 8 pixel in there. And look, now it's... oh. I'm sure I can do it. Oh. <laughs> Beginner friendly, right? Maybe I'll end up nerfing all of this. Maybe I won't. Right? That's super nerfed. It's basically not even a 60 pixel ledge. Um, but it's slightly more nerfed. And we want to get you enough height so that you can go over there. 
You can even do it, just do it with your double jump, which is great. So probably I'll get you up a little bit further before I do that one. Will I? Oh yeah, well Voracious Reader wanted me to talk about empty space. Maybe we'll talk about that too. So I guess if you have like a level, especially if it's a one screen level, and you don't make levels that often, it's really tempting to want to maximize your space usage, which often results in cramped core grid, which is not bad, you know, it has its place. Um, but you're going to suffer in coming up with unique scenarios in that type of format. So one tenant you can use right away is don't worry about using every inch of space that you have. Um, and there are a couple ways to do that. One way is to do a block layout first. Um, I don't do that very often, but really quickly, for example, say if we have this kind of stuff going on over here, it's like, oh, well, you know, maybe you land over here, and I want you to gain some heights, so you go there, you maybe have to go there, then do like a platform mock thing to get over this way. Uh, you know, fine jump, fine jump, uh, do some water stuff down here, and in a couple gates. That wouldn't be bad if I fleshed the outlines um, and just filled in the blanks. That could result in a really fun map. So don't be afraid to start with stuff like that. But then also, don't be worried about just using space to decorate. So, you know, if you end up with a big block over here, as is common, you know, fill that in with decorations if you want to. Uh, use it to practice your background skills. Use it to put some space together in a way that looks funny. Um, because all of that adds to the flavor of a map. I'm just thinking about how do I make it so you can't get on that ledge from here. And it's going to be tricky, because I've already set myself up for a kind of bad position where you've got all this open space. So there's a couple ways I can do it. Well, this is going to need to go higher up. Probably to there. And you can probably do that there in level 4. Well, I've got that 16 pixel gap I was talking about again. It just happens. Um, and then, the, yeah, the big problem is I can't occupy space here. Because that, if you do that, then that allows that. So what about, like... More. That's a good trick, and I do like it. That would work on that side. And you would have to. Oh, it's really close. It's almost there. It's really close. Cheese. That's pretty cheese. <laughs> if that works, that's crazy. I can't believe how useful mini swipes are. I recommend that everyone use them all the time. Yeah, I think that both solved the problem and didn't look super jank. I just have to test it from the top again, but I think based on this guy, um, who I've used a few times, uh, this little fella, I suppose you could say. Sometimes I even reduce the apple size because I suck. It's not my fault, it's the stem, and possibly a line. Uh, okay. And yeah, I'm just looking at that, that's not going to be super jank. Well, true, bit jank. Oh, then you're not going to have to do the side switch, though. You know what, that side switch sucks. Screw that side switch. <laughs> but I arguably don't have to do that. Mm, I like it, though. <laughs> there, now it literally is just a 60 pixel with an apple on top. Um, and I'm going to test that for full jumps in a second. Organic looking spike shapes sometimes just results in a natural little curve that is fun. Help me, I'm stuck. I'm stuck on the ledge. Oh, I forgot to full jump. Okay, hold up, hold up, hold up. So that that might suck then, because well, obviously that. But aside from that, yeah, no chance. Um, second one's no problem, and there's a lot of range for it as well. Um, so you know what? If you don't always have to let them full jump everywhere, and I've probably got a full other, a few other, other disallowed ones, later. but that one we're gonna allow. So far, again, no gimmick usage at all, um, just because this is a simple needle map. But you know, we could throw a little bit of water in somewhere. 
Right now I gotta think about how I wanna do the rest of the jump. If you've got the space, I don't I don't wanna allow the full jump. I would prefer to lower that. And then just kinda do that to make it cozy. And can we get you back in there? I didn't do the open corner yet. Oh no, I already did the open corner. Well then I would do the plane. One thing you can do, which I'm not good at, but I'll try to show. Um, you'll see this in the Uhuhu games more than anything else. Is uh, spike shapes, obviously, but those spike shapes then being interacting with the drop in some way. And the reason that that's cool is because, in addition to disguising how you would then want to do the drop, which is a part of it, um, it also creates unique movement scenarios just out of the fact that, oh, you wouldn't normally put like a weird inverty thingy there. Um, also, again, be unaware of that 16 pixel because it's right there. It's very, very close. So I would argue we have to move that. And then it gets kind of sketchy. Well, let's see. I could talk about that here. Maybe this is a point to talk about that. So in addition to all this stuff, Mini spike uses and drops is insane because they create that 16 pixel overlap trajectory automatically. And because they occupy so little space, the window to get around them is quite wide, right? I could pop off with mini spikes at a certain point, I feel like. Because this is the overlap again, right? But you want to create not a soft, like not a formula necessarily, but like something you can kind of gauge by eye. I, I'm pretty sure that's doable. Heck yeah, it is. Can we just give you like one high up landing or whatever? Heck yeah. Right there? Oh, then you don't need to go under again, so fair enough to you. Mm. How do we get you under? Is it right there? It might be right there. That's a bit wonky, but I can look at it. Oh no, it's not. That's not a lot. Right there? It was the only room. And then it'd be cheesy. That's funny. I like doing things in maps that are funny. That just is funny to me because <laughs> it just creates a scenario where if you're not 100% sure about the kid size or whatever, you might try that someday. There's still no way to reach it. You know, be like, oh, why did they leave that open? I could totally get through there somehow, even though not. <laughs> Alright, there's your landing. Um, and then you can create more unique jump scenarios, right? One thing you can do right after that is to require a walk-off or a bonk. And there are lots of different ways to do that. Everyone has their preference, right? Um, that's a pretty standard required walk-off. Where you have to, uh, if you're holding forward, you'll die. So you have to tap and then go. Uh, that's another one. It's a little bit more aggressive because you don't have as much leeway. Um, there are different variants right there. So if you lower that, it's another one. It's, it's harder to do there. Are there any other ones that we're talking about? None that come immediately to mind. You can do ones that are further out as well, but they become, they become less part of the walk-off there. So say if we have that one or whatever, right? Um, lower it and extend it. That's still a walk-off, but also look how low we are relative to the starting position and how much big the stagger is it becomes a bit of a problem. So I think I'll probably do that one. Mm. Yeah, it's just, yeah, how do I don't get that space back? Um, that's not my favorite. That's slightly better. The only, yeah, the only thing I don't know is that. Can I look like this better? Alright, not that bad in practice. I think I'll leave it. Um, another thing you can do for new players is making jumps that don't involve spikes, but they're just about the sheer distance, because that's really fun sometimes. Although you have to be careful that you don't end up doing like weird setup or line-based stuff um, for new players in that region. So you make a jump that's technically possible, but you need to be aware of the lines or um, you know have a specific etc. etc. That one I would say is fairly friendly. Even if you full jump, you're not going to bonk. Well, I'm tempted to make it bonkable in some way. Lower that by one. No, because then you still can't, right? Uh, we're gonna be clunky over there, but maybe. 
Is that good or bad? A new player is going to full jump into that. And I think only on Maker do you have enough space to do the dip that low. And J2 Allura and Engine Man, you get eaten. So I'm divided on whether or not that's good. Normally after a drop, I do like to provide a save, or before a drop. So you can kind of make save decisions that difficulty balance relative to your save positioning. Hmm. Alright, I'm going to leave that bit in. If it ends up being too tough, then maybe I'll, I'll, like, I'll repeat playthroughs if I can't get it over. I'll nerf it, no problem. Remember again, as new players, that long jump is scary, so maybe give me a little bit more space here before they come out. It's not bad. And they get a chance to full jump here, which is not bad. Um, it's more fun than that. I was going to say. More than ease. I think that ends up being possible without too low a ceiling. Yeah, and it's not as bad as a sure can jump, I would say, either. Although, if you're running at it, you want to be a little bit more careful. Yes, yeah, a little bit of room. Oh, I would leave it. And then, so there's your default diagonal, right? There's your nerf diagonal. <laughs> there's maybe nerf by one more diagonal. Why, why not nerf by one more, just in case? You can debate whether or not those are intractable enough. Maybe with a double jaw, I can't even hit one. You can't, basically. I might just leave them like that. Just add to the decor. And then if you're going back to forth like that, especially on the sides, if you get into like a narrow confinement of space, this little area over here, you're gonna start running into a lot of the same jump ideas. Which can be fun depending on how like how much you enjoy repetitiveness in your maps. A really, really common one that I like to do. Two, three, four, so that we're up there. And then, like, over there. <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. No, no, I have to load it up on my Oh, no, you can full jump that. What am I doing? I have to oh, extend it by one. Ah, right, uh, but then there's no room over there, fair enough. Um, yeah, it would have to be, like, right there, right, basically. Hold on. It's not that 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 one. Which is it? Because I was end up getting. Oh, it's on the same blah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. So stuff like that, where you could just you could make an almost infinite series of jumps that are very similar to that, um, just to ascend every time. And I do like jumps like that quite a bit, but time and place. And lack of. So what can we do with these cool mini spikes that would be like unique? Nothing come to mind so far. Other than that's scary. You don't necessarily want to acquire that. It could be there, but I don't want to acquire it. Could be a bit prohibitive. It's a pretty classic one though. That's the classic like uh, nerf steak or whatever. You have like the five or six frame. Pretty fun for an intermediate level player. I can't even do them properly, but, <laughs> but I think for a new player they might be scary. Maybe you can nerf that a bit. That one's pretty fun. I like that quite a bit. And then that gets us out of the problem of having to climb the stairwell on the right side, too. Leave that like that. Also, really funny if you then can't go over it. Right? Soften the landing a bit. Um, as a new player, no. Nerf for Even a nerf gate is going to drive me questions right now. Mm. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. I just take a bit of work to do because you have to go into eight things before. It looks like it might be annoying. Oh no, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. You do have to do the quick succession bombs. What if we what if we lowered it by just a minute? 
I didn't want it to touch the sides. I hate that. I hate when it touches the sides. That's much better. And you can do a walk off if you want to. But let's make it so you, you have to like work with the cubes. You decide if you want to do more right, here. I'm in cube land. What's the play here? Is the play to go under the cube? Or to go over the cube? I am not good enough to make a jump with it. Um, under is a little bit trickier, and I'd have to nerf that block section and block that off by quite a bit. What I might do is this. Any spike saves today yet again? I guess you could go straight up though, so is there a way I can make it so you can't just go straight up? Block would be the obvious answer. Dang it. I think the only way to require the dip would be to extend the QD. Maybe out the direction. That's a little bit too close. It's like the time you have this way too tight, I think. Cool. Did we find it? No, because you still get, well, you can get it with a, a late bonk. You know what? I think that's perfectly fine. My only regret is that that's a cube, or that's not a cube. Can it work? Cube land? I'll take it. Because I have to make this possible. A couple ways. And then just for a new player, I would sometimes include, despite the simple needle name, like one or two moving gimmicks, because I think those are like old school and they invite a lot of curiosity. Oh, thanks, Woozle. Woozle said this is coming along nicely. Yeah, it's not doing too bad. I'm working quite a bit slower than I normally would, just because I'm explaining everything as I go. Um, but for a new player map, I think this is pretty friendly so far. It doesn't have quite enough pizzazz to it yet. Especially for a new player map, I would quite often include more complex elements. But I think, especially for for people who are like me anyway, at least starting out, I love maps like this kind of stuff. Where it was really just, do the needle, and the needle was fun. Um, however, we might want to get one living spike in here. I'm debating this one. Let's take a look at it. Um, so that goes along to there. On the reverse. Top speed for that is 1. I like to do 7.75, but it does create the same problem sometimes. Yeah, I think overall that's not too bad. And then what you can decide to do is how do you want to height limit it? Um, you know, how interactive do you want it to be? Uh, maybe I'll section this off for later. That could be the ending if we leave a section for the just by one there. Yeah, that, that could be okay. You also notice a lot of working with quite a closed aesthetic. Almost everything is attached to everything else. Um, if you don't want to do that, then work with a crazy wild aesthetic. Because I think open levels are sick, I just don't know how to do them. <laughs> Can I come up with a cool water thing? I could, but then I think that would defeat the purpose of the level. But no. I mean, 
that's the obvious one. It just looks cute. And it's painful on the other side, so maybe not so much. Up you go. Even then, it's just mesh for me. Because it doesn't create anything new out of the water, it just it has the most basic usage of the water. And then I'm kind of tempted to leave it in, though, because you don't, you know, as a, as a contrarianism, you don't see that a lot, maybe you'd like to see it more. Right to your congressman. Let them know. What though? I just got it. Two ways you can do this. This is the way I used to do it. The other way is with a spawner. Um, the reason I don't use the spawner, or I didn't use the spawner back in the day, is because I didn't ever need one on one projectile on screen at time usually. Yeah, it looks clunky if it's not going into the what you call it. You can stall if you want to. It's slightly more interactive. And in a section like this, you can just courage and lock while also having the three little platforms here. Well, not just courage but you can force it. It's even better. You could do that, but it's a bit messy for me. It's just gonna end up being stupid. Basically, <laughs> unless I four pixel or something, it's not gonna work. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, so tiny. Maybe? Hold on. We stumbled onto greatness. The, ti <laughs> the tiny with the tiny diamond. I I'm keeping it. <laughs> it's base now. Right there? Yes. Also? Ah. <laughs> no, wait, that one needs to be slightly further. Doesn't it? No, because then that looks like an ancient soul. I'm leaving it there. And also, haha. -ha. <laughs> there. Now it's slightly unique. It's interesting. You should alter introduce wall hugs. Oh, that's a good idea. Although theoretically, it's sort of done a little bit at the beginning in terms of where you want to go for the drop. Um, just because it would be much easier to like then hug the wall and then swerve versus hugging the wall the whole time. 
I'm not even sure how I would go about introducing a wall hunt, to be honest. Um, I only had one more walk-off scenario in mind for the very end. Or do like a little platform box, which I'm sure kind of fun. You get up there, can't you? Hold on, hold on. Yeah. Too hard from the top, is it? No, it's quite easy from the top. There we go. In a section like this, I have a runners. Well, yeah, you basically only have two options at this point: is to either use spawners or well, moving spikes, I guess. But even mini spikes are going to be too low because you don't have the clear and mini block the ceiling, whatever. No, thank you. I still haven't learned how frequent is a good formula for these. I'm still trying to learn. I feel like it's probably like closer to this range. Yeah, that looks not too bad to me. And then you just put a little object indicator so they can't get away. And then to... I usually do an offset. I'm not sure if it's good to do an offset though. I feel like it is, but... Maybe it's not. Maybe it depends on how closely spaced they are. Like, I would like to give you at least that much room. These guys. One of these. Yeah, I'm going close. Put over my one more. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. So we've gone over a lot just on one small map. I do want to do some checks for it though. For example, let's do this end section and see how bad it is. Oh, it's quite free. So you just wait a little bit, you're good to go. I could argue I could arguably make it faster, but I'm not going to. Um I'm just gonna say it's one getting through, no, that's supposed to be like that. Um you can decide for yourself if you want to color the fruit different colors. Level. There's your start person save for an easy level. I like the saves to be above the ground so the players can see them. Let's do some quick tests. I want to say I think that's impossible, but I don't know for sure. I would like to be a little bit more sure. Yes. 
suck though. So yeah, one of the problems with pathing is you gotta go back and retroactively check all the pathing. And while you can you normally be confident with certain formulas, the one thing will work out. For me it's just that you have to burn your double jump so early, therefore there's not much room for you to get out. Um, there's a couple ways I could reduce this. But I think the main thing being is this gate formation here, that top spike versus that bottom spike there, narrows your window to a certain frame, and then you're always gonna hit one of those. So I think I'm okay. I obviously can't go to the far left, so I'm gonna have to go down this way. Wasn't that swerve bigger in the original one? Or was it always just a hold right into I feel like there was more hold right there. Was it there? Probably oh, No, it might have been on the other one that was more hold right. Yeah, I just don't want you to be like doing nothing here. And I don't want the swerve to be too big either. Yeah, you still don't have to do the, an actual swerve underneath it, you just tap and then tap again. Which is not ideal. Yeah, I don't think there's a way to set up a full double there, so I think what I'll just do is like tap and tap. Because you can't hold, but you can tap and tap, and that's fine. Easy. No problem. I wonder if I can see if I don't need to I just walk into it, but I can see. Nice, nice, nice. Yes. Yeah, I just can't sweat through my buttons and arcing sometimes. One day I'll get a new controller. Yes. I'll put a save point somewhere near-ish there. You, I think you can do the walk-off too, but the main thing is just like set the forward press. Because otherwise you're Here we go. Oh, oh, oh. One last thing I'd like to do. And now it is decoration time. And this is just point where you can outline the important aspects of the level. For me, I always like to outline water, object paths. And I am not very good at decoration, so usually once I do that, I have no idea what I'm doing. Sometimes I'll do like a, like a soft drop shadow, but I don't know if I'm not working it that well. Good at it though. And I want to leave those specifically so you can see where the apples are. It's important.
Trace, you can also soft trace a. Uh, you see this a lot in Kaizo levels, not very much in uh, Maker levels, where the literal path is traced out for you with coins or a prop or something. When I was in to a uh, a similar making community, no, not an identical one, there was a similar practice that was good to follow. If you wanted somebody to do something quite complex, it would be good to give them a movement trail. Which I think is a good idea. But I don't know how functional it is in here. for a good solid test run with saves in places to find out where those go now. So I will take away my baby save point. Go full hog. See what we get. Let me said either wanted to be here or the one after. To me, that drop's not that bad, so I say right here. That way, if you're a new player and you go, ah, <laughs> you get a little bit of leeway. And you're not dealing with too much misery into the second half of the save. I think right there, because that cube jump is going to get a lot of people, if they're just looking forward, they're going to get this. It gives you plenty of time to deal with the spike, and then I think just give you a nice room to deal with that water as well. It's, it's definitely nerfed, but... I mean, probably barely even need to wait for those, if at all, but I like to wait for them because I'm scared. Then it is up to you how much additional decoration you want to do. I do not know how to do much else besides just put little hearts on the same point, so I like to do that. to change the apples, but I don't. Sometimes it's fun to make a spinning apple, but not today. Sometimes it's fun to hide a mouse on the level or a rat, but not today. But it's gear or whirl. Good old upload on there. Now failed the first jump. Already garbage. No, just kidding. Oh, I want to do the cool dip. I get really excited for that loop at the end of the level. Apparently people didn't like it as much as I did. I have to loop this cool as heck. Dang it! Dang it! I guess I could ask myself if this is really going to be that hazardous for a new player, but... There's also a certain amount of how much you think that the needle is like interesting and interactive. So you can see where you're supposed to go, what you're supposed to do. Oh, that was not my fault. That was lag. That was my fault. How far are you supposed to be? What? I thought I had plenty of room. At the end of the day, it does say simple needle instead of beginner needle or easy needle. And the reason for that is because I struggle on the easy needles a lot lately. I used to be able to kind of quickly burn out a stack of four. They had four screens per, per map or whatever. But holy cow, they take a lot out of me now. So I want to see if I can get to a place where I can make something similar, but not exactly the same. Damn. 
still not quite as easy as I wanted it to be. But it's definitely one of the cooler dizzy variants I've seen of this. You do the spike grab up the water or whatever. Oh, I'm going for it. I'm going for it. I missed my jump. I should have just. I definitely should have gone for it. Oh, I should have gone for it. Hey! Finish that level in approximately one hour. It's time I take to find my color palette. Yeah, she says. <laughs> well, yeah, if you're um, if you're making every... Oh, thank you for the good game as well. Yeah, good game. Um, um, if you're making, like, a very few levels and you're paying a lot of special extra care and attention to them, it's just going to take you longer in general to make your decisions, right? And for that, I would say, like, that's probably a low to low mid tier quality effort for me. It's definitely fun, but I definitely said for a lot of the jumps, um, oh, here, this is good enough sort of thing, you know? Oh, first player, Golden Blues, going for the clear. You've got to make it past the one hard section, which is this lower left one over here. Once you're to that, you get the drop, you're good to go. Like me, he is scared of the ledge. They are scared of the ledge. Oh, and the drop. <laughs> um, so yeah, maybe just as a quick summary for, for what we learned then, um, is pick a pick as many of the concepts and ideas as you can for the level first before you actually start working. So you kind of have answers, quick answers to questions you might otherwise ask. E.g., should I use water here? If I use water here, how do I use it? Um, as pointed out by Gaffro, if you pick one level element and really kind of interact with it in a lot of different ways, that can make it an amazing level. So if you make choices to do that if you can. Um, don't be afraid of empty space, although there isn't a lot here. Uh, some of the jumps themselves contain some decent amount of empty space. But don't be afraid to let like a whole quarter or half of your map just be full of blocks. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, use that space to decorate or use it to make cool little formations or use it to put empty jumps or secrets or easter eggs or whatever you want. Good game. Well played, Golden Blue, for the first clear. That was awesome. So that's myself. Well, whatever. <laughs> um, balance around save integration if you can, so try to make it so that when you test the limits of each save, put a save right before the jump you start dying on, um, because that way you won't have people choking on the last jump, and the last jump won't be the hardest. It balances in reverse, in fact. The first jump will be the hardest, but that's okay, because you can grind it with a setup, because you happen to have a save right there. Do it the opposite of the way you would think to naturally do it. Um, any other major concepts? Always nerf. If you're ever afraid that a jump is too hard, nerf it. Even if you think a jump is too easy, don't be afraid to nerf it. Um, don't be afraid to learn little formulas for yourself so you can do jump layouts quickly and then make them unique afterwards. So those are things like the plane formula of 64 pixels, um, the 16 pixel overlap formula, right? Um, also formulas where you can just sort of add things to jumps um, whenever you want. So an example of that would be uh, for... Actually, I'll make a new map for this. I'll so show. Um, an example of that would be landings. So remember we talked about landings. Any of these can be a landing variant, right? If you want, they just all have different flavors on their inputs. Um, I forgot the other landing... Oh yeah, so other variations of things, right? So say for any jump you want, you can have an F-jump starter, right? Where that requires an F-jump, and then look, it's a gate afterwards. So you do the F-jump and then you do the gate. You can also have any jump start with a ledge. So you just do that, and then there's the gate over there. So you do that, right? Um, you can add a lot of things to pieces and pieces to jumps, but what you want to do instead of just thinking about them as those bits and pieces, like a gate with bits added onto it, is think about the motion, think about the types of jump, you know? A hook jump is a type because it provides that turnaround motion, right? A bonk jump, you know, where you have to bonk out of the corner here, you know, is a specific type of jump. An F jump is a different one where it requires that bonk and cancel thing, which is similar to a stake, right? And all of those are therefore different to just jumping over some spikes. I can't think of anything else explicitly that we covered. Um, a lot of time was spent just making a level, so maybe that will get it out. Maybe it won't because I don't know how to edit. Um, but thank you for everyone who tuned in. I had a really fun time, and I hope I was able to provide just a little bit of insight on the, the level creation process. Um, follow if you can, because I'm trying to get to affiliates so I can give out rewards and stuff. And uh, bye for now.